So, hello everybody. Good evening. People are dropping in. I'm going to close this here. So, welcome to our uh, webinar with Alice Wielden this night. Um, we're going to talk about um, Seiki and the mystery. And I'm very much all looking forward to that. Um, I want to introduce to you um, Alice Wielden. Um, some of you might know her. Um, she's a Seiki practitioner um, from London. And uh, she's been practicing Seiki way over 20 years. Um, she studied uh, Shiatsu before that and um, studied very closely with Akino Bukishi, who is the founder, the person who developed uh, Seiki um, over the course of um, over 30 years. Um, he died in 2012 and um, Alice and um, he um, wrote a very, very interesting book about Seiki. And um, ever since um, Alice caught fire uh, for Seiki, she has been sharing her experience, sharing her knowledge about it, um, giving workshops, uh, treating uh, many, many people. And since a couple of years, since three years actually, she's been um, um, giving workshops in, in my school in Heidelberg. Um, and um, pretty often the question comes up, what is this? And uh, for people, it's quite mysterious, this Seiki thing. It's um, quite a bit different from other treatment methods, um, treatment forms. And I hope we can uh, shed a little light on this mystery tonight. So I want to welcome you, Alice. I'm very happy that you're here. Um, and um, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. And um, hello to everyone from London. Um, I apologize, I know it's a little dark behind me. It's, it's just as, as much light as I can get on the scene. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to, what I'm going to do this evening is I've got a little PowerPoint prepared with, which will hopefully, um, it will give you something to read as, as well as something for me to talk to. And we'll be sending that out with, with the recording of this um, when, when we finish. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to talk to that and then Rene and I, We'll, uh, that will be 20 minutes to half an hour or so. Rene and I may then exchange a, a little bit of uh, comment and then really the floor is open to you if you have any questions or want to just make some comments. It would be lovely to hear from you. Um, so I'm just going to hand, I'm going to share now my PowerPoint so that, and so you'll stop seeing me and you'll see this. Okay, let me get this set up. Should, yes, okay. So, I wanted to, I was wondering what to talk about this evening, and I thought Seiki and mystery, because as Rene said, Seiki is, or always was, a bit of a mystery to some of us, maybe all of us, in some way or another. And I could talk about mystery and Seiki in so many different ways. So I've been working to try and pull it down to a few threads, but I recognize that there may be other th things I'm missing. So please feel free to ask about that. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about Seiki generally and mystery. So Kishi called Seiki the secret art of Shiatsu. I mean, for one thing that that's, can be a bit of a mystery to people um, to begin with, the relationship between Seiki and Shiatsu. Oddly, people don't often ask me about that, which I don't know why, but anyway, I'll, I'll talk a little, just a little bit about that. Seiki is in the Shiatsu tradition, and um, within the Japanese arts, when a student works to understand the art, to as much as they possibly can, there is a chance that the art itself will transform in their hands and become something new or something just a little new maybe, or very new and very different. And this is not the same thing as adding something to the art. It changes, it transforms through the attempt to 
um, understand it. So for, for Kishi, who was really a great shiatsu master and a student of both Namakoshi and a, the top student of Masanaga, he worked so hard. He, I remember him saying to me, I just work, I wanted to do shiatsu completely correctly according to my teachers. And he worked and worked and worked. And then something, he had to stop, something changed. And for him, a new way of working emerged through this. So Seiki is, so then he called this Seiki Soho to recognize this difference. Um, as in the proper way, in the traditional way, he also changed his name. So this was not walking away from shiatsu. In a sense, it was walking right into shiatsu. Um, so it is within the shiatsu tradition, but it must be called something different. It is a re rebirth of, of the art within the tradition. So that's why Seiki is still called the secret art of shiatsu, certainly by Kishi. And um, I want to just say that mystery is very important. I've got little moving bits here, which I rather like. Um, mystery is very important in, in Seiki. It keeps us wanting it, keeps us moving towards something. And the diagnostic, I'll talk a little bit more about diagnosis, but diagnosis happens in the moment, which is always changing. It happens in the mystery. And an art, any art, I suggest, attempts to capture the feeling, some feeling in the moment. We want to find a way to catch whatever feeling it is that we want to express, and we express it through our chosen art. And for me, and for increasing numbers of people, our chosen art is Seiki, Seiki Soho. And another thing that uh, Kishi and I talked about sometimes was magic. And he was very keen to say that this is not magic. People would say to him, uh, what you're doing looks like magic to me. I, and, uh, but he would say, no, 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 this is not magic. Magic is a sleight of hand. It is the intention to mystify you. We go to magic um, to watch magic because we want to feel this mystery. We, we want to be tricked. But Seiki, in Seiki, there is no intention to mystify or entertain or impress. This is a very different thing. This is not magic, but it looks like mystery very often because things happen that we can't explain and we may not understand. We may never understand. And for example, particularly in the workshop, Kishi or me, when I touch somewhere, people say, well, I don't see what, what, what do you see? I don't see what you see. And I suggest that this is because you haven't developed this kind of seeing yet. Kishi, for example, as some of you may remember, he used to talk about, he used to see smoke. So he would say, ah, I see smoke here. And um, hardly anybody saw smoke. I sometimes see a little bit of smoke, um, but, this, but this is not because it doesn't exist. It's because you haven't developed this particular kind of seeing, but this is only a matter of time and practice. The mystery is only the mystery of the less experienced practitioner. This is not magic. And just to say a little bit more about this kind of seeing, um, Seiki Soho is, um, sorry, I'm just moving something on my screen out of the way so I can read this. Um, practical skill of learning to see differently. We have to develop a different kind of seeing from the one we do in normal life. So we're not looking. When we just look using our physical eyes, we see a body, we see clothes. We don't see more than that. So the mystery of seeing, Seiki seeing, is only a mystery to the intellect and to the idea of seeing with our physical eyes. But when you learn to see, 
in a different way, learning to see through feeling through all the senses coming together and knowing in this different way through feeling. There's no mystery. So this is not really a mystery. Again, it's the mystery of how experienced we are. So Seiki is a journey. It's from mystery to a greater understanding, but also to more mystery, as we'll see. So the student begins by seeing maybe just a little bit. I mean, you become a student of Seiki because you do see something, you feel something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be interested. If you saw, if, if there was nothing there, you'd go on and do something else. But I know all of you see or feel something that you want. So the student begins by seeing some, a little bit or maybe a lot. People are all very different. Some people see a great deal in different ways. Then gradually, as we become more practiced, we start seeing something. And it's a little bit like the mist rising or going into a dark room. And to begin with, you see nothing, it's just dark. And then slowly things seem to emerge through the darkness till you can, in fact, often see the whole room. It's this same feeling. And this, this becoming, this starting to see, keeps calling you. The mystery calls you to keep moving towards what you don't currently know. So wanting to know and being open to what's there. This actually helps the client and it helps us. This is real help, just wanting to know. I mean, even on the most basic level, we all know that if we meet somebody who really genuinely wants to know who we are and understand us, this, this can be very, uh, uh, well, this is always a, a very good experience for us. It can, and it can be very healing. So this alone on the most basic level. But we should, be, we should try and be clear about mystery and, and what is mysterious and what isn't so mysterious. Some things that are now a mystery can become known to us. For instance, what's in the unconscious can become conscious. Through work, you can become conscious of anything in the unconscious. And we can learn how to see in a different way. And this, this is a skill that you can just let anybody can learn it. Kishi was a highly skilled, and I've been doing it for many years, as have a few other people. But anybody can do this. Anybody can learn to see. But other things will always be a mystery. So it's good to be clear. And the clearer we are, the more use, the more help we are to other people. Remember that the person will always remain a mystery in some ways. So we work to diagnose, not in the way that is taught in Western Shiatsu, but we're still working to diagnose. Both Masanaga and Kishi said that we're working to diagnose a life, not a syndrome. But what is a life? A life isn't just a body, it's certainly not a mind, it's not the conscious or the subconscious. So what is a life? You can't know much about a life, for instance, by dissecting a dead body. It was um, Galen, the um, Greek physician, for example, he started dissecting dead bodies. And of course, it's very interesting to know how bodies work. But um, when this was brought to Japan, for instance, I think somewhere around the 17th century, there was a, um, a strangeness, because how can you know about life from looking at something dead? This is a very good question. A life is also something of a mystery, but it's, an, it's largely a mystery to the intellect. And in some ways, it's not a mystery to our feeling. We, when we're working, are a little like the sun. 
we're shining on a flower, we're just the sun shining on a flower. And this sun is an influence, we are an influence on the flower, and the flower opens, its life um, becomes fulfilled. But the sun doesn't make that happen. You don't see the sun making the flower open. You might talk like that, but really, the sun influences the flower and the flower opens. The flower opens itself. And we know this happens, but we don't know, we don't really know how, how it happens. We might know a lot about plant biology. We might be able to explain it in those terms, but it doesn't change the fact that the sun influences the flower and the flower opens. And this is, in an important sense, in a feeling sense, a mystery. And the diagnosis, coming back to diagnosis, this is the treatment. Masanaga said this, and Kishi certainly said this, uh, but this is not what we do very often. Well, it's what I attempt to do, but many of us don't do this. We have to separate diagnosis and treatment. The information comes to you, but every time a diagnosis arises, in fact, you must let it go and keep asking the question, what is this? And as you ask, as you put your hand here and you feel this place that you wanted to touch, there's an even greater mystery. You feel, ah, oh, this is tight, maybe, or kyo. But then you ask, what is this, really? And the meaning falls away. So you walk towards this meaning, you move towards something you think you know, and it moves, changes. We, as I've said here, you, you know more and less, but this helps, this itself, this helps the person, it helps you and it helps your clients to make these distinctions and to keep working like this. And from the client's point of view, is feeling the influence, your influence, like the sun. You may be able to name it. Some people do. Uh, Namakoshi called it the mother's touch. Uh, Masanaga called it life sympathy. And Kishi called it safe hands. We can, but, but we still, change happens with safe hands. Change comes, but it's a bit of a mystery. How does, what is the connection between safe hands and change? And that people repeatedly say, I can breathe again. I feel like myself. I'm here again. Or that, and you see their lives changing, their relationships changing. And a strangeness can come. People feel different. And this is real change. And real change can feel quite mysterious. You've come into a genuinely new place. And the connection between you as a practitioner and this new place is in some sense a mystery. Another kind of mystery that I, we're dealing with is the subconscious. Uh, we're all at the mercy of our subconscious, as long as it stays mysterious to us. Um, but we as practitioners are in the business of bringing consciousness to that. And slowly, this, what was subconscious, comes out of the place of mystery as we put, as we shine the light of our consciousness on it. So I touch this place, this unconscious place, and the feeling initially is of something turned away from me. But gradually, this turns to face outwards. It recognizes itself. And there's this feeling, I, I don't know, that I've forgotten the Japanese word, but there's a word for key coming, this feeling of something coming. And my recognizing meets this place of change. So this kind of mystery dissolves and the person becomes clearer. So the subconscious is definitely a place that goes from mystery to clarity, potentially. This kind of mystery goes. But there is a genuinely unknowable, which we will be well advised to recognize the existence of. Some things are truly unknowable. And we work in the context of most things 
being unknowable. However, we have, we have a little problem. Um, certainly since the 18th century, or it was beginning before the age of reason or enlightenment, we have had this idea that if we apply our intellects carefully, we can know everything. But this is just a way of thinking. It's quite useful. We've certainly learned a lot from this way of thinking. We've learned a huge amount. And maybe you could say that this was, in many ways, it is useful knowledge. There's no denying it. But it doesn't help us develop, I think, individually as people. This is just a way of thinking that we can capture the world. Most of the universe is not just unknown, but it's unknowable to us anyway. Our attempt to know it is an attempt to control reality. Um, and I see this, I, also, I see this with clients all the time. We all are trying, our psyches are trying to control reality, uh, but it's pointless. We can't completely control reality. It's also an extremely boring way to proceed in life. It's tight and it makes us dull. More than that, if we keep defining the client, we do two things. We box them into our ideas and we stop being open to them. If, and once you've done that, you have a distance from them and your connection is very reduced. So understand that you can know the client in a way, but you must also be completely open to the reality of how they are. And that includes being open, I think, to some things being always a mystery. I just wanted to throw Socrates in here because he's such a good example. He defined himself. He said, well, I, I'm, he went around looking for the wisest person, but he kept, he kept proving that they were not so wise. And um, he, he was wise, he realized, because he knew that he knew so little. So the more we look, in fact, and this is fairly well established in some ways, the less we know, and the more, in fact, becomes a mystery. But the thing is, in order to be practitioners in Seiki, we still have to want to know in order to perform successfully. So this is a little paradox. You, you can't know, but you want to know. You have to want it badly. Desire is very important. Um, and being human is so tied up with desire. We know from Buddhism, Buddhism has this cent center stage that desire brings so many problems and attachments. Um, but it is also key to manifesting ourselves in this life. We have to want life. We have to want to manifest. And our desire can, in fact, bring us into our lives more. So mystery leads us to find out more. So how does this continue to relate to Seiki? We're with this person in resonance, very important, the resonance. We want to know who and what this person is. This is a kind of diagnosis, this diagnosing this life situation. We recognize this life situation to the extent we're able to, and anybody can recognize some life situation. And to this extent, we are all useful, valuable. We can all do good work. And in the moment of this recognition, this open, non-judging recognition of this life situation, change happens. So I sit down and I have a framework for a session, but I never know what will happen. And this is not a trick. This is true. I never know what will happen in a session. And this is essential for the work. It's our job not to be safe, but to be real. And this, is, this is the real medicine that we can offer people. So it's exciting. The secret of touch is a journey into, into not knowing as well as knowing. We can touch. Ask, yes. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, here in the Q&A, there is a question. Um, why just not knowing? And I, 
I wonder myself, so you talk about not knowing is very important for this kind of work, but what do you, like, is there a, a necessary knowing kind of, <laughs> <laughs> or why just not knowing? You have to have um, an attitude of not knowing. Of course, you're also an expert, but it, you almost become an expert in the art of not knowing. You have to be safe hands. And in a sense, that is a kind of knowing. It's a kind of willingness to trust, which is a kind of knowing. And you have a framework, as I said, mentioned in the last slide. Um, you have a basic framework, which is a kind of knowing. But all I know is that I want to know and that this is a person. Mm -hmm. But... but but is there not like any knowing necessary for this work? I mean, of course, how to set up and kind of where to touch on things like this, but knowing about um, physiology, knowing about energy, knowing about um, life and illness and whatever. Um, I suppose yes and yes and no is usually the answer. I, I think that these things, the more mature you are, the more you know, sometimes this is useful. Sometimes you find this knowledge coming up in a session and it seems to inform you. But Kishi's favorite treatments um, in the last few years were from a little boy who, whose mother brought him to workshops because she didn't have childcare. Um, this, was in, um, this was in Munich, I think. Yeah. Um, and then he continued to come and Kishi loved his touch because it was so empty, so not knowing. And there were always people who came to Seiki and there still are people coming to workshops who hadn't done anatomy and physiology, hadn't done shiatsu. They, they know all sorts of things about life. Um, and this, these people are not at any disadvantage and perhaps they have an advantage because they, they're not held they don't have so many fixed ideas about treatment, about medicine, about what we should be doing. So um, I think if you have wisdom, it's going to help you. But if you have ideas about how you should do treatment, it may, it may not be so helpful to you. Mm. So I, I don't know if that is a very satisfactory answer. Yeah. So um, how to deal with uh, the need for knowledge we all have. <laughs> yeah. How to deal with that um, is that you have to want you have to want the truth more than you want to be right. Mm. And if that's if that's what you want, then this is the thing for you. I yeah. suggest. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, I realise that I've been talking now for half an hour. You're quite right to interrupt me. No, no. Um, just quickly for everyone who is listening, yes. um, you can you can write your um, questions on the Q and A. Um, section here um, in the in the software um, and later we even open uh, for for talking but meanwhile you can put your questions here and I think you if you want to go on with um, okay I'll go on yeah. I'll be quite quick I'll just go through the last few slides I realized because I was I was uh, talking a lot without pause there so and we'll get just get through this um, so yeah well, I think I've just kind of said this, really. So, um, what does this mean for practitioners? That the skilled practitioner really works to recognize the human condition. It is much bigger than just this uh, little pain or this cause. This is a much bigger project that we have in Seiki. Um, and this brings heaven and earth together in this moment, in this person, in this body. Really, Chinese philosophy has been saying this for thousands of years, but here we are. We're, this is what we're doing. Um, so it's a way of capturing this life situation in this moment. And touch is very important. You could, you could just go into a room and meditate on your own, but touch is tremendously powerful here. It brings us now here to this body, to this moment, and to this relationship. It's very powerful. So it marries the unknowable with the knowable in this human situation and our everyday lives. So the spaciousness, it's maybe rather crazy language, but this is what I think is, is true for this work. I think it's very important work 
um, brings you know, eternity into, this is what humans are. We're not just bodies. We're not, uh, we're not just minds. We really, we marry um, the nothingness with the ordinariness. But, when, <laughs> yeah. but um, you talk about touching the now, touching, touching life, touching the life situation, touching the, the, the personality of, of this human being. But in the end, it's, it's touched through, it's, um, it's a body work mm -hmm. and there's a physiology and, and all that. So do you have a, a more concrete um, example, maybe? Uh, what really happens? Well, people come with, um, usually people do come with a particular problem, if you like. Although it's often, as, as I'm sure you, uh, it's true for everybody, it's often a little hard to define for people. They just don't feel okay, but they may come with a pain. Um, and this is fine, you recognize this. This is a, the life situation showing up in this pain. And this is the, the beauty of the work. It, it is both at a very ordinary level of hand on body and the comfort of this, the comfort of that motherly touch. And this alone, I mean, as, as science will tell us as well, this is very helpful. It releases good hormones and all sorts of things. But we're doing more than that. We're doing that and more. We're also, in order for this to be highly effective, which it is, Seiki is a highly effective way to work with people, this connection is touching the, intending to touch the life and not just the body, has profound effects on people's lives. It changes, people change at a molecular level. Mm -hmm. Their life situations change. And if you're just touching the body, this is not going to, this is unlikely to happen, I suggest. So do you have, a, do you have an image? Like when you touch a person in a session, what do you touch? Well, my hand is often touching the body. But I am, this is where I'm coming back to seeing, because you also have to develop this sense, this feeling seeing. What I'm trying to capture, which doesn't, which is hard to define in words, is this feeling of the life situation, this feeling of this particular life. And that is a feeling, and that feeling has no judgment attached to it. So mm. I'm trying to capture that, and that comes with practice. Mm. But it also comes with intention. You have to intend for that to happen. Mm -hmm and then see, be led by that intention. Yeah. I'm going, I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen actually, I, so I can see. Do you want to go on with the discussion or are, is this yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah, going okay. to stop sharing so that I can be a bit more in, in this. Okay. Um, Sarah writes, uh, thank you, Alice. Could you explain in a little more detail what you mean by the unconscious becoming conscious? To what is the unconscious becoming conscious? The intellect, mind, or to something else? The unconscious it isn't really very mysterious. It's just things in our minds that we haven't been able to face in life. I mean, this isn't very controversial. You know, Freud would say this. Um, uh, so, but we can become conscious of that. So, for I mean, on the most basic level, we may have suppressed a trauma, and that trauma can come to the surface and become conscious to us. And it can become conscious through psychotherapy, maybe, but it also through touch. And people often remember things when they are um, in the psyche session like this. I mean, as I, I know they also do in uh, shiatsu or other ways of working. Mm. Just trying to find out where I can open the microphones. Yeah, anyway, you can also raise your hand. There is a button somewhere for, to do that. And then I can unmute you if you want to speak to us. Um, Gabriel asked, do you need, do you not need to know yourself as a being beyond body-mind? 
and emotions in order to really do Seiki. <laughs> know yourself. Well, it's always a good idea, isn't it? It's a good idea. It's a <laughs> definitely a good idea. But um, we're, we're all capable of that. And, and Seiki is a practice of becoming more aware of yourself. So if you think that you can only start from a place of real wisdom and self-knowledge, then you might never start. So I suppose there is a sense in which, yes, perhaps you do know, you need to know that in order to really do Seiki Soho. But I'm not, but that sh I, I, I'm very strongly, I, I want to encourage people to do this because this is also a way of knowing yourself. It's, it's very powerful. Um, from, for me, it's really a, a, a step forward and a step back. Like when I de develop my work and my experience, I get to know myself with every challenge I take with new people that coming. And then um, I kind of hit a, a line where, where it's strange. And then, um, then I develop myself because I recognize some things and then I... I don't know, I take a break for a while and, and then something happens and then I, um, I get deeper. Um, and then something, something else shows up, shows up. I think you're never done with that anyway. No. And, and I, I really encourage you to, to touch um, with this questioning too, to touch with this, what, what is this really? Because if you do this, I think it also becomes clear, I suggest, and I'm very interested to know what people's experiences of this is, that you recognize that this is not a body. I don't know what this is maybe, but this is not just a body. Uh, so I think, I think if we can be brave enough to sit with this question, then this, this comes to us. What do you what do you think what happens when um, when people feel or when people are rec recognized or when people feel they are being recognized or when they see this mirror or whatever what do you what do you think what happens that that is important in a psyche session? Well, what people report is and and it's been my own experience is that they typically feel simply feel more at home in themselves i mean and that can be a greater or lesser extent i mean sometimes i mean clients off the street if you like um certainly would feel a lot more relaxed but even those people who know so little about the work will often say things like oh i i just i'd forgotten where you know i, I was off somewhere and i now i'm back here i'm i'm here again um i can feel myself um and this, this is just very common that happens when you're recognized. And I think we all crave this. We all crave this in our romantic relationships. We crave it in life generally for somebody to see who we are. But if somebody sees just your rubbish and your mind and your craziness and your body, this is not satisfying. Mm. We, we, we kind of get angry with this really. We want ourselves. No, I want you to see me. Yeah. Sarah has a question. I wanted to um, comment on the experience. It, for me also, it really <clears throat> is not a body that I'm seeing and that I'm touching, definitely. Not only a body, it is also a body, maybe. And I wanted to... Um, comment on on gabriel about the having to know yourself mm, to me it more feels like that we already inherently do know and doing psyche to me helps me to reconnect with that knowledge because i can only recognize in the other person what i can recognize in myself so it's uh, like whatever I'm recognizing in the other person will also expand my knowledge of myself. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Gerda uh, writes, my understanding of Seiki is different. Seiki is about ki and life force. Uh, we don't do during a treatment, we connect resonance. Uh, through resonance, the key flow of the receiver awakes when it is in an anesthetic condition and the original built-in intelligence wakes up again, gradually. There is no way you can understand life key flow. You should be empty and humble with an empty touch um, to the universal key will do the work. Um, Gerda Kebel, I've been into Shiatsu over 40 years in Seiki for 20 years. Hi Gerda. Yeah, I, I don't think we're talking about anything very different here. Yeah. yeah. Empty touch, very important. Key, I don't know, um, this flow. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you feel this, this you see this um, whole flow and pattern opening up and changing. Yeah. For sure. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I I don't know I I didn't I didn't hear you talking about the doing really, and I don't know um, this <clears throat> wanting to. What did you write? Wanting to find out, wanting to see. For me, it's something else. It's not like wanting to know it to to put it up on the wall it's something else you know what i mean like wanting to know about this person to understand this person to to be able to describe it it's not it's not to be able to describe it no yeah no it, the desire you you um i see peter hi peter um yeah this is desire is very important in sake absolutely crucial um yeah. Akishi would absolutely say that too. If this, um, you're holding up a mirror, you have to want to know. You have to want to touch. You, you, this, this is crucial, and this isn't just a, I fancy doing it. This is I want to know. Things have, in a way, we used to, you know, things have to be bad enough for you to want, really want this change. Change yeah. is not so easy. Real deep change is not so easy. You have to want it. Yeah. Another question from Gabriel. Yeah, I was just wanted to say that um, what I find happens sometimes for me is that um, as I'm with someone, I get or hear their story or I, I, ideas come to me. And what I've learned with you is just to kind of just drop it, just to kind of let these ideas and even perceptions, just let them all go if, you, if I can. And it's a sort of, yeah, that's just, it's really that process. And then somehow I find the resonance comes, the something, some, some deeper process seems to be taking place if I can just kind of drop these arising concepts, if you like. That's all I want to say, really. Mm. Thanks, Gabriel. Abs absolutely. It, I mean, you, it's analogous to a meditation where you, things come into your mind but you don't give them energy and this also in seiki uh you the diagnosis comes and you let it go you let it go you let it yeah. go yeah and it comes to you it is not a this is not a looking for something specific this closes things down this is an open empty hands looking yeah, yeah and the quality of feeling is I mean, feeling is, is, it's just a sort of approximation somehow, because it, it's ever, it's ever shifting, it's ever changing somehow, I feel, but the, the feeling, the concept or the, the experience of it is never quite knowable, as you talk about, it's a mysterious thing um, in itself. Yeah, and then sometimes there's a um, resolution happens, and, and this is a, uh, a finishing point as well so sometimes things sim become be almost become known become conscious and then it's almost they're no longer interesting thank you gabriel there's another comment uh from mark nichols somehow seiki allows me to know how bad i felt 
I only glimpse your life as something passes. Don't totally get that. But that's what it says here. Um, and a question from Ali. What is your clinical framework? More specifically, how do you make notes on a session and chart client process, uh, progress? Chart pr progress. Oh, um, I, I hold up my hand and say I don't really take notes. <clears throat> I probably should and I promise people I will, but um, I, don't, I don't, it doesn't occur to me to do that um, in where I intend to. Um, Kishi did. He used to take notes in Japan in his treatment room, <laughs> so for the record. He used not to do that when he was traveling in Europe. Um, chart progress. That, well, I, I check in with people, really, and I check. Um, we, ha we have discussions with them. Very often what they're coming for has cha changes quite quickly. And they recognize the value in their lives and the, the way it's helping them change or um, you know, it does depend a little bit. So I chart progress by talking to them about, about encouraging them to chart their progress and how it's helpful to them and uh, where, whether they now is a good time to continue or take a break or this sort of thing. So I have that deliberate conversation with people and, and that's how I chart the progress as such. The progress is often not what people expect it to be, but they're, they are almost always very happy with what arises. Yeah, and how much is it about um, the process versus the moment? What would you say? Oof, I'm not even sure what you mean. Could well, you the say? process of like um, um, working with someone over the course of a of a of some months or a year uh, versus the the moment the person is here. Okay, I'm always focused on the moment. I mean, it is it is very interesting to people to me to see people's lives change. People changing quite radically over time but in the moment i'm interested only in recognizing this life situation <clears throat> mm. over, so there were two, two separate things i'm not particularly thinking about their progress until i see them and see the progress um mm. I, I progress is a is a funny one what are we progressing towards mm. but, uh, they, people don't always know I mean, they often know they want to get rid of a pain and i mean a very basic level pain normally resolves itself um, or the situation changes so that people are more comfortable and happier um, so on a, I suppose on a clinical basis it's a very successful practice um, but I'm uh, but that's a sort of slight byproduct almost yeah um, actually this question fits um, to that um, Theo or Theo asks um, if I will let go of what comes to me, why should I want to see them? Like, why should I, why should I want to see this, see this life situation, see this person if, I, if I'm letting go of it anyway? So what does it, what does it serve? That, that's, it how I, that's, that's how I no. understand the question. It's possibly that I don't understand the question, but um, I'll try. Um, um, and maybe you could, whoever's written the question to you, perhaps you could continue writing if I'm getting it wrong. Um, the life situation is layered. It's, uh, it's fascinating to me to recognize this life situation, to work. It's not something I just, sometimes it's very obvious, but mostly it's I to work to see, to recognize this, to see this, to feel this. Um, and it's, and I, I, pieces of it become clear clarify and then they fall away they simply stop being interesting but there's plenty more there's plenty more of that pattern that life situation to become clearer and at some point in the treat a session really this usually stops um being so interesting the person it has a natural ending point of simply things coming still, more still, the breathing changes. It's not so interesting anymore. 
at this moment and it's often about 40 45 minutes um as a sort of natural progression so it's 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 ever interesting to me so in the way that to meditation something comes up you let it go when you've let it go it's there may be an empty space but that also is interesting you're open to that too so you're simply open to what arises what will arise open to this empty space yeah but but can you say a little more about the wanting um to know there's another question here um um, it seems to me that wanting and any kind of specific intention uh, needs to be abandoned at the outset. Wanting is not an intention as such. I mean, your intention um, is to meet this person, is to be in resonance with this person. You have to have some intention or you wouldn't be there in the first place. Um, and you, so you, you, have to, you have to want to know. You can't just sit there. It's not a passive thing, Seiki. It, it's very engaged. Um, so, but it, it's not engaged by trying to do something to the person. You're, mm. you're an active participant in this life. And, and you have to want to be there. You have to want it very much to be there. Mm. And to be in resonance. Yeah. Well, I think to be in resonance, to be in contact, yes. You have to want this. Mm. And then it sounds, maybe, maybe it sounds very obvious. Of course you have to want it. But actually, you really have to want it. This is difficult. I, maybe it's not so difficult. Some people, at some point, it becomes easier. But there's, a, there's a, a courage required to sit there not knowing what's going to happen. Mm. Not, um, and not trying to give satisfaction in some way, but by being open to what's really here. It, yeah. is, it, take, it takes a lot of courage. So you have to want to do that enough to stay with the, in the little bit of um, frisson of anxiety that that might bring. Mm. Yeah, Gil Hall writes, uh, the words we, are, we use are limited uh, to the experience. And that's, that's, that's what I just came up to me. So wanting to know, I mean, all you talk about, it's, it's, it's pointing to what, we experience it's it's impossible to 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 grasp it through these words uh, so she writes um, i so understand you when you say to see to know um, yet it is so easy to misinterpret these simple concepts in the context of seiki hi jill i don't know I, is it i don't know you just want to know and you set out and you say what is what is this what is this I, I, I don't find it so difficult mm. or so or so uh, you know or so dangerous we've got to speak these things um we can't to, to make the attempt it's not that the words then we should be um, married to these words or fixed in these words or think that we have now a technique because all this is not true but but we, but the attempt to speak these things and to explain what we're trying to do is in the age-old tradition of, of, of Zen, and um, and we let these words go as well. They don't matter tomorrow. They don't matter in the next few minutes. This is just an attempt, and maybe the attempt helps us to take a little step forward. Helps us because now I recognise something in what you do that we share. And now I understand a little bit more. Maybe this changes my touch a little bit. Maybe my mm. touch is more open or more something. So, so these, these words are not important in themselves, but they're, it's important to make the attempt. Mm. Yeah. Um, Lisbeth is asking, what do, you want, what do you do when you want to touch, but you feel fear or hesitation within yourself to touch the person there. Sure. sure. I, I mean, we're uh, probably leaving the mystery uh, theme a little bit, but it's still, um, uh, yeah, actually it isn't. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. It's, yeah. I, th I think for me, then you try. You, because the mistakes are, you, it's virtually impossible to make. Work. Even if you, tr if you try, try and make a mistake. That could be quite good. So it might, be quite interesting to try and make a mistake 
but anyway you try and only in trying will you know if it's the right move or not so i i uh, and you can people on the whole wouldn't notice if it was a mistake so only you would know but in order to develop your sensitivity to the right place the right time you have to try and you have to recognize the wrong place and the wrong time so this is a very good place to be in being a little bit frightened because then you can test this so i really encourage you to to just test it out you can always take your hand away again so what about wrong and right in the sessions well, there really, I mean, there really isn't so much wrong or right. There's more right and there's more wrong, but mm -hmm. in the end, everything could be made right. It's your choice. It's really, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dylan writes, I am one with the other and one. Um, I am one with the other. Um, so I, I guess once you have this feeling of being one, there's... Um, right or wrong is it becomes obvious what's what's yeah yeah mm. sure uh, well i yeah uh, th there, is, there is it's an important point of, of merging uh, where your hand you're following the movement so closely that there is hard to know whose movement this mm -hmm. is um, and in that sense you're one but in order to be in resonance and have relationship, there need to be two people here. So it, it, some sort of over merging is also not desirable here. We're not trying to merge it. And maybe that's probably not what you mean, Belen, yeah. but um, just to say this. And there are two people in the end. There are two people, but sometimes we can become uh, our psychology mm. <laughs> wants us to merge in a way which is more actually infantile and um we're not looking for that with a have to be two people for resonance mm -hmm. john fielder writes hi alice thank you as you know my training with kishi was at a time when he was working mainly off body i sometimes see smoke and auras auras during sessions i always try to be empty when i practice but utilize my intent to heal i wait to feel change but i think perhaps this is the patient uh, remembering what I felt like to be to be well over the years I have changed my practices and uh, now like to touch a mother hand anyway just wanted to contribute that um, that it is also possible to give Seiki through proximity as well as touch John oh thanks hi John uh, yeah uh, yeah of course I mean if, uh, many of you I'm, I'm sure will have seen Kishi work off the body he, uh, uh, of course, this is, of course, um, the, the, this touching, but the hand is not necessary for touching, but, the, but it is reassuring. Uh, Kishi came back to the body for a good reason, and it, it is safe hands, it's very important. And, and I think touch also reminds us where we are, and, and we're so often actually out of body somewhere projecting ourselves onto the world so that touch really brings us back to this mm -hmm. life yeah yeah um mark nichols um comments the words are questions the mystery is why we need to ask insistently thank you mark <laughs> nice yeah very nice um any other questions maybe one or two last questions if you like i know panayota wrote a couple of times here um the last week i'm focused on the touch on my hands doing gyoki during the session and i feel that this is the essence of this work Words okay. come or don't, but it seems that they don't matter. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, Theo again, how can I just be there if I desire if I desire something? Can you say something more about this attitude of desiring, please? 
Well, I mean, the, the problem is as soon as you start picking it apart so much, we have to, it's like we have to hold all those things. What is empty hands, really? It's hands without agenda, hands without <clears throat> pushing, forcing, or really, um, and ha hands without trying to make some, somebody do something or uh, manipulate. Um, but you still have to want to know. And so, and these two things can exist at the same time. Um, you have to want to be there. And you have to want to give your attention to this other person. You have to want the truth of this other person in this moment. I, whether you can, even though paradoxically in a way you can't have the truth, the intellect cannot be satisfied with that, but you still have to want to know. So mm -hmm. you have to be both empty and inquiring. And, and, and this is absolutely the essence of any practice, any art of this kind, all the Japanese arts. It, it's a powerful discipline, but requiring your will to be there and to practice and to um, erase self. So this is a two, it is paradoxical because you require your will and yourself to be there powerfully and yet you are erasing these at the same time to be in harmony more with just what is. So you have to just relax into the paradox and do it anyway. <laughs> relax into the paradox. Yeah, I quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. Hold on. <laughs> okay, I, I got two, uh, two or three more questions here. Peter asked, could you say something about timing? Timing is very important <laughs> because this is an art and it's like, uh, it's just because maybe you see something, maybe you see I want to touch, but not now, not now, not this minute, because now is not the right moment to touch this place. So timing, it's skill, I mean, you can, you can, you can do Seiki with terrible timing and it's still Seiki, it's still good, it's still great. But, you're doing this but the more skilled you become the more practiced in the right time the right place then this people people feel more and more met more recognized you 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 see this this becomes seiki soho not just seiki this recognizing this pattern uh, these changes so yeah but you have to make a lot of mistakes to sometimes get the right timing. And then of course you recognize this right timing. So the only thing to do is to uh, continue, continue to practice. And this feeling of right place, right time comes. So this all sounds a little, oh, what's that? This all, all <laughs> sounds a little complicated. Is that Seiki thing so complicated? <laughs> Well, if once you start to talk about different aspects, it sounds mm. complicated, but really it's, this is when, where to touch, where is my desire to touch, when to touch this place. I rec I see you. This is very simple, mm. but it's a little hard to do. And maybe talking about it helps sometimes. I've found that talking about it can help. Mm. Hopefully not to become more complicated, but my apologies if it seems so. And, and can it be too much? Can it be too intense? Ali um, is asking, can you have too much Seiki? <laughs> <laughs> not in my world. Overdose. <laughs> yeah, overdose of Seiki. Um, I, I think there comes a point where you feel enough. This is enough. Um, and time is time really doesn't come into that time stops being relevant when you're really met is you can be really met for a moment and this is a this is i you know this from your lives i mean sometimes there's been somebody in your life who's really just briefly met you recognized you and this mm. maybe carries you in life a long way so time really is irrelevant yeah, totally. uh, maybe, mm. maybe if you just want more and more maybe there's this not quite satisfied feeling um i, I don't know maybe that's yeah. not what he, you know, he also writes here for a week 
for a week, someone practiced, practiced on me every night after the Chicago, Chicago intensive. And in the last practice, I felt a little disturbed, like it was too much. I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to talk to you more about that. But I, I do know that some, maybe if you felt it was too much, it was too much and you should just that. Um, but then sometimes it's not all fluffy bunnies in that it, it's not all, you will start hitting your resistance, your, your rubbish, for want of a better word, the difficult feelings will start to come up. It's not just that we feel relaxed and good and met. We might feel met and angry um, and met and discomforted. Um, and this is also very important. K I, Kishi it was a very crucial point for him, anger. Um, he received, um, this is before really Seiki came into existence. He received a very, very light, shiatsu treatment from somebody and he was furious he wanted this pressing this like masanaga's heavy pressing and he was ah and then he ah he looked recognized himself ah his anger is coming up it's a very interesting point <laughs> so i don't know maybe it was too much maybe so but maybe just something different coming up it's, it's good to question that and being disturbed no, can mm. be, can lead you somewhere, doesn't, no. Yeah, and you can always stop if sometimes you don't want this change right now, and so, so stop, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, other, um, Bart asks, are there any dangers in Katsugen, for example, with people who have heart problems or something like this? Uh, well, if you look at the Seitai literature, it does, there is a suggestion there that if you have an uh, implant, like a pacemaker, the body in Katsugon is trying to get rid of <laughs> uh, rubbish. And there is a suggestion in that literature that um, implants, you, you maybe don't want to do Katsugon if you have implants. So yeah, I, mean, I, I, um, I would trust them on that. Um, so. I mean, there's a whole lot one could say about Katsugan and uh, there's no immediate day. If you're just doing a little bit of Katsugan now and then, I, I think it's a, a great thing. I mean, if it becomes your main practice, I think um, you're, you're inviting a lot of change into your life um, and you need to be prepared for some radical change if you're doing that. Uh, but for most people, doing a little bit of Katsugan now and then is, is, is a great, relaxing, uh, very, very refreshing thing to do. Yeah. Good. I think we're going with this with this one last question. Um, this is a nice question to round it up. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, you, you can go on for another hour probably. What do you think is the difference between Zazen, Zen meditation by alone and Seiki sessions? <laughs> well, there is a huge difference. It's like, where do I start? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, of course, Zazen is tremendously they're both going in the same direction. They're both in a, really aiming ultimately for the same thing. Um, but, but this, having this working with people is tremendously powerful because our problems in life are about relationship and working with people brings this to the surface, brings this rubbish to the surface um, very quickly and very powerfully. And together, we can join our ability to deal with this together. And, and so I think really it speeds it up. Um, it speeds up the whole process. I mean, that's a short answer, which I'm gonna to stick to for the moment. Mm. Um, yeah. Good, great. Yeah, it was quite a journey already. Um, thank you very much, Alice for sharing your thoughts on that, sharing uh, coming from your experience. Um, the, whole, the whole story is difficult to understand, difficult to put in words. Um, and I only can encourage everyone to, to make your own experience with Katsugen, with Gyoki, with hands-on work, with Seiki, um, even with meditation and sitting and watching, uh, watching your, your life situation. 
observing yourself. Um, so I'm gonna say goodbye to everyone. We had roughly 60, 70 people here uh, right. from um, all over Europe and even from overseas. Very nice. Um, have a good night or even a good day wherever you are. And um, Alice, I don't know if you wanna. Uh, well, I was just going to flag. Um, I'm often in Heidelberg with René, as he's already mentioned. I think we're almost full for February, whenever yes, it is. But the, the, space... the February workshop is, is booked. It's full. Okay, but the, yeah. there's space in October. And I'm doing something with Nick Pohl in London in Jan. I've actually forgotten. I think it's January, the end of January. So, um, or February even. I, I can't remember. It's on the website. So if, if people if you want to explore more, also just contact. It's been really, really nice and really some interesting questions. We will do more. We'll be doing more of this. So, so um, all of Alice's uh, workshop dates and contact is under um, uh, www.livinginresonance.com. Dot dot com. Yes. And um, our workshops are under www.keycollege, kicollege.de. And um, Alice's workshops um, in Germany are open for um, English speakers because it's, um, it's um, completely held in English. Um, yes. Um, so, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.